This is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, innovation in the legal industry, and the impact tech is having on the law. I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Percipient, and on this episode, I have a conversation with Michael Clark. He's the VP Global Head of Digital Transformation and Futurist at MasterCard. He and I talk about a new paradigm in the ownership of our data and what role the law and regulators should play in it. If you've happened to listen to some prior episodes, you might have heard me talk about Web3, which some describe as the future of the internet. We're currently living in a Web2 world and have been for quite some time. The Web2 world is generally considered centralized because it's run by big tech players like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, et al. Those companies either own or control a good chunk of the computers that run our daily lives. As a result, they also have a lot of data about us that we don't have a lot of control over, nor is it easy for us to access. But what if we flipped the script and we actually owned our data and we had to authorize others to use it? That's where the promise of Web3 comes in. Unlike Web2, if it takes hold, Web3 will run on decentralized networks like blockchain. And as a result, users will have more control over where their data is stored, who can access it, and how it's used. Today's episode is a pretty heady conversation with Michael Clark. He's the VP Global Head of Digital Transformation, and he's a futurist at MasterCard. He's in the midst of writing a book called Data Revolution, The New Currency of You. Michael and many others like him believe that data is going to become a new currency, and that to date, we have overlooked its value. He believes that we've given up much of our control and access to its value because we've been too focused on what we're getting in exchange for the use of our data, i.e. the software and the tools we use. Michael's got a great background to write a book about data and its value. He's been in banking for a good bit now, and he spent a lot of time working in open banking, which is a practice that provides third-party financial service providers access to consumer banking info through APIs, or application programming interfaces, which is a technical way of describing how different apps talk to each other. So, if we're going to take back our data and try to capture its value, how's that going to happen? And what role will law and regulation play in it? Well, that's what Michael's here to talk about. First, he says the focus on data needs to move away from just data privacy and for regulators to also focus on security, ethics, and bias in data usage. He says it's also going to take a new way of thinking, specifically more cooperation between regulators and the tech industry, to effectively manage data, shifting from the focus on tools that are using the data itself. He also believes that AI will play a big role in data management going forward because there's so much data. And because it will continue to grow, AI is the only way we're going to be able to harness its value and keep track of what data is used for all these apps, including AI. So I cover the digital and strategy elements, but I also wear the hat of, uh, of a futurist helping our customers think about the future of data and the future of value. What does that mean internally? What are you doing as a futurist at a major multinational corporation? What's your day-to-day role? To be honest, it's it's advising clients on on effectively what the future could be. So, you know, it's, it's not only helping them in the here and now, but it's also helping them understand some of the signals that are emerging and giving them the, the opportunity then to respond. Obviously, a lot of the work that I've done historically has informed, obviously, we're going to talk about the book on, on, on this podcast, but, you know, a lot of the, that book is the, it's the origins of many years of work. You're MasterCard now, but you've been in banking for a while, specifically open banking, which makes sense as to why you're here today talking to me and what you're interested in in data as an asset in the future of data. But let's explain open banking, because I think it's important to understand that about your background and how that kind of morphs into what we're talking about here today, data. Well, it's quite funny because it, my background goes even further back than open banking. So I was involved in data in you know some of the biggest banks, I guess, in which globally, playing a role in data itself. And then that logically took me into open banking because of that heritage. And open banking at its very heart was about giving control back to the consumer, giving them greater levels of transparency, but then creating a playing field. And open banking really is not where the excitement is. It's just a stepping stone to what many refer to as open data. So I was always interested in more so what came next rather than what it was at the time, even though it was revolutionary, given that the UK was the first market to ever do it. So open banking, like in everyday use cases, maybe they use Plaid to connect to a financial services application, or they're using Rocket Money or Copilot, one of these other applications that grabs their bank data. That's kind of the, one of the main use cases of open banking, right? Through APIs, we're getting your financial information that can aggregate and you can get use out of it. Yeah, so there's two. That's one, which is the account to account or aggregation use case, which is very common. The other that is being able to make a payment outside of the banking app. That was a big one because 
that actually enable third parties now to offer me a means of making a payment without me having to log out and go to my banking app. So now all of a sudden that became a one-stop shop. The danger obviously for banks when open banking became a thing was disintermediation because now obviously I don't have to go into my banking app, limit the bank's opportunity to cross-sell, but that then in turn then created new premium products, premium APIs, a lot of ways then for the banks to retain that stickiness. You're absolutely right. It is the account story, but also there's the payment component, which really starts bringing through the volume and the integration. I think it's interesting, the EU, because I think this is what where the data part ties in. In 2019, the EU revised the Payment Services Directive, I think it's called PSD2, and it mandated that all banks allow their customers to share their account information. That data became theirs. It's not the bank's. It's the customer's information. That's kind of, you know, where it's going, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I think the interesting thing is, even though you have consent how that data is used, it's still truly never yours in the sense of what happens next. So the origins of the book are steeped in looking backwards to understand how we got where we did. And open banking was a, a catalyst to a thought and a hypothesis which then you have to take further to its nth degree. But what's really interesting is that countries like Brazil, who have the PIX network, uh, which is another form, which is a digital rail, and now have adopted open banking, that has led them to the point where data monetization is a possibility for them. And we should mention, too, your book is called Data Revolution, The New Currency of You. It's coming out end of this year, end of 2024, right? Yeah, it is this year. So that whole book, quite frankly, is a combination of a career, but also a piece of work that I did four or five years ago where I was asked to look at the future of data up until 2030. And it was one of those moments where you're writing this thing and you realize, my God, you are shaping the basis of a new economy. And it's sort of one of those hairs on the arms moments when you're writing something. And then you realize that, you know, this had to be a book or it has to be at least something because you were almost laying the foundations of what could be a new economy almost. We're going to talk about two big things here, two big concepts. And then we're talking about specifically regulation of these two big things. But I want to kind of front load this. I want to ask you, first of all, when do you start thinking of data as an asset? But I also want you to explain two of these key things that I think are going to underlie our whole conversation here. Is number one is, and you kind of alluded to there is, as of right now, our data isn't really our data. It's owned by Google. It's owned by Meta. It's owned by whatever app you happen to be using. But you believe that's going to change and we're going to own it. And I want to talk to you about how that's going to change, how we're going to own it. But secondly, and more importantly, is because we're going to own it, it becomes an asset. And I want to talk about how that's going to look, how it really becomes an asset. So let's talk about this first. When do you start thinking, when in your life do you start thinking, well, dad is an asset and this ownership is going to change and we're going to own it and we're going to get something out of it? It's a great question because in writing, you, you realize that data has the same characteristics as an asset class. So actually it has the same characteristics as you would gold or any other asset because it's unique, it's diverse, it'll eventually become scarce. So you look at all the characteristics that would attract an investor and all of a sudden data follows exactly the same characteristics. What are those characteristics? Like gold, obviously it's a store of value. It's a store of value, but what's interesting with data, data brings something unique because it's everything and nothing at exactly the same time. Where gold is absolute, right? It's this, this thing, I can, I can price it, it's easy. Whereas data, by definition, in one environment, it could be worth a million dollars. In a different environment, the same data could be absolutely worthless. But equally, data is also a utility. So now you have something that's a store of value, but also a utility at exactly the same time. So it's actually even more powerful than a normal asset. And to answer your question, when do I know it's valuable? Well, this also ties back into reframing what value actually is. Because today... Data isn't property from a legal standpoint, and it isn't classed as any form of value. So it's almost ubiquitous and it's everywhere, but we don't look at it in the lens of value because we don't treat it as such. So all of a sudden, if someone now turns around to you, well, actually, do you know what? You could extract X, Y, and Z from your data. All of a sudden, now that becomes an interesting conversation for me as an owner, because now I'm looking at it through a completely different lens versus something I just give away for an experience, which is what we do today. Let's talk about that. So how and what needs to change so we actually become owners of our data? Because right now, if I sign up for Meta, you know, it's collecting all the information, it knows how old I am, it knows my things I like to buy, it knows my interests, and Meta owns that. You know, I, I can maybe get to it, but it's an arduous process. But how is that going to change? How are we going to actually become owners 
And instead of us giving this data away to use Meta, they're going to need to come to us to use this information. It is a really good question because it's not just about data. So in the book, there's almost like this, this three magic trident that has to be true. Two of the big building blocks are identity and data. Because let's not forget, data and identity have never been connected throughout history. Identity has always been seen as a security and a passcode. But the actual true definition of identity is a state of being. And data in Latin actually means gift, which is ironic, which is something we gift away. So, Which we have been. Which we have been, right? <laughs> so for those two things to be true, ironically, one of those things is already happening, which is countries around the world now are creating digital identities, digital IDs, which is lending us back to self-sovereign identity in some nations. So that's the first piece of the puzzle. The second piece of the puzzle is having data ownership and actually making data property. Now, what's really ironic in my research, you know, patent laws were created way before we had computers because people were stealing artwork and people were forging. But you could argue a painting is a form of data. We've often, throughout regulation, missed the opportunity to look at data as a form of property. So you're probably guessing where this is going, is that the regulator holds the keys to be basically unearth and create the basis of an economy. And with that becomes the need for education, which is where the regulator comes in of who to trust and who to share with, reclassifications of data itself. But more importantly, we need those foundations then by regulators to say, look, one, we have a digital identity for our, for our citizens. Secondly, data monetization and ownership becomes a legal right. Once you have those components in place and people are educated and aware of what this means, you're on the way. As I was preparing for today and reading your materials and, and read about that concept where the regulators, where the government needs to say, the people own it. Meta doesn't own it. Google doesn't own it. The people own it. I started thinking about this. It's kind of a foreign concept to the United States, but in Europe, you've always had this, these moral rights to artwork. There's something you own in an artwork above and beyond just the fact you made a painting. It's an extension of you. And that's kind of a similar concept here. Your data is an extension of you. Absolutely. And in the book, the last piece of the trident is value. And this is why then you have to look at data through the lens of intrinsic and extrinsic value. So the intrinsic value of your data is the heritage, cultural significance, the age of it, what does it mean to you, how unique is it? All of these factors define something that is of value to you. Then that is then translated into a form of extrinsic value, which is ultimately what the market is prepared to pay for it. So when you start looking at these things, you have to almost go back in time to almost a time of bartering where goods and services were exchanged based on that mechanism of intrinsic value. Because once we hit the Industrial Revolution, it became all about productivity and efficiency and uniformity. So everything had to look the same. Everything was done through scale. But in doing so, we lost elements of value along the way. And when we start thinking about sharing data and owning it, the irony is you end up going back to those systems because I may exchange data with you, for example, not based on a price. We may have something each other wants because it's valuable. So let's take the example of diabetes. I may be, as a person, I have a profile linked to my data, and I'm tracking my diabetes using traditional medication. Another person somewhere in the world has the same condition, but is choosing to treat it differently. They have a data set linked to their smartwatch as the identity profile, and they're treating it through nutrition and exercise and various other elements. Who is to say those two people would go, hey, why don't we swap? Because we both value each other's data, right? And we swap, and then through our learning and cross-pollination, we generate new data, and we push it into the ecosystem. And who's to say a research agency or an AI picks that up and suddenly creates something completely different? So on one hand, it's about value to value. On the other hand, obviously, there is a price based on an intent. When we come back in just a couple minutes, Michael explains that to properly regulate data, regulators need to move their focus beyond privacy to the ethics and security of data use. And he also explains how AI is going to play a big role in data issues going forward. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Percipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. 
We're just about to get back to my conversation with Michael Clark, but before we do, I want to direct you to tlpodcast.com, as I always do. At that web address, you'll find an episode page for this episode and every other episode we've done in the past. On those pages, you'll find links to more information about our guests and more information about some of the stuff we talk about. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me on LinkedIn or X or email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. All right, let's get back to my conversation with Michael Clark. We pick up with his take on how regulators are going to have to shift their focus beyond data privacy. So today, we still think of data in the lens of privacy. So throughout history, we had an opportunity when the initial start of GDPR was created in the US, ironically enough. And then that formed the basis, or at least the principles that were underpinned by GDPR. In all of those cases, privacy was the paramount concern. And I, I totally understand that, given where the world was at that time. But we almost missed the boat in that first moment to say, well, actually, these are, what is data? It's memories and stories and interactions. That's really what it is. And by definition, if you treat it that way, you'd go, well, maybe that belongs to people because it's, it's, a, it's a perspective of their life journey, right? So it, it, we miss the opportunity. And again and again, we keep trying to use privacy as the vehicle to protect people. But the reality is, as we get deeper into AI, that data privacy, I guess, approach becomes even more complex. So you can argue data privacy has been applied throughout history, but has it really truly been successful? Because we've had data breaches, we've had high scale thefts of data with high fines, which made it very public. But as we get into the world of AI, do we really believe that humans are actually going to be able to keep pace and monitor all the data being created by an AI to prove that it is private? And you say that the focus got to shift from this privacy to the ethics of it. What actually happens is once you shift from privacy to ownership and choice, the regulator then can shift their gaze to more of what I would call not that privacy is important, but more of the critical things the world we move into, which is security. Um, the ethics, bias, all of these elements, which ironically underpin a lot of the data that we use today, but we, we seem to be trying to bat it away with privacy, rather than saying, well, actually, if it's my data, I, I should have the choice of how private I want to be, because I own it. And because I own it and the choice I have, because there are now technologies that allow me to be private and have that choice, it almost then turns the, the table to the regulator to say, right, now I want to make sure you protect the ecosystem while I act out to my choice. Does it need to be regulators in your mind that need to do this because we are so far gone with the companies that, no, we're, we're just, there's just not going to be a switch tomorrow where, hey, Facebook, hey, Meta, hey, hey, Google, I'm not giving you my data anymore. You got to buy it from me because I, I can't do that alone. Is, is that why it has to be regulators? Or is there another way outside of regulation that this shift could happen? So I think it's a combination because I think if you look throughout history, regulators have struggled to keep pace with technology. And some of that is because they've not been necessarily involved in the original research of those technologies. So if we take AI, it's existed since the 50s. It's only until 20 million images a day were created did we, did we suddenly see regulation around AI. And you could argue it's probably a bit late, but it's still good that we have it in certain shapes or form. So... Yes, it will be the regular overseeing, but the technologies powered by AI done in the right way will play an active role in terms of overseeing. Um, because again, don't forget, there's going to be so much data flowing around that it's going to be impossible for a person to even attempt to do this. It's going to be a combination in terms of how those regulations are defined with industry. Because the best one in the world, you can't expect a regulator to turn around today and become a technologist. Right. But they have to be involved in the very early stages of a lot of the things that we're building towards to one, understand it, but also work with the people who are building it to ensure the right guide rails are in place. So this is, in some respects, what we're now saying is now the regulator has the opportunity to lead and really drive this change. And done in the right way, the regulator then could be the key to unlocking a whole new economy that's been with us since we've been alive um, it's only just been amplified because of our ability to generate more data than we've ever been able to do before. You just mentioned this. You say that for this to be effective, it's a multi-pronged effort. You need regulators, the government, to cooperate with industry. But how's that going to happen? Because that, that's a mind shift too, right? Because now you see it every day in the papers. Regulators generally, I mean, I shouldn't say they never, 
but I mean, it's, it's antagonistic, right? You know, the, they file lawsuits or they, you know, they say they put the kibosh on mergers. There's this adversarial relationship generally between regulators and industry. It is. And, and you know, there's clearly bits in this journey that are not an overnight switch. Like, let's be honest, no one's going to get expect all their data back on day one. And let's be honest, you won't get all your data back. You know, today we use terms like PII and things like that for personal data. In a world of user-owned data, there's no such thing. There's just data that you own. It's user-owned data and a mixture of verbal and non-verbal. And there'll be data that will be societal data, which is owned by everybody has to give for research purposes and specific use cases. Give me an example of that. If something I have to give up. There may be stuff from a health perspective that you carry, maybe allergies or things like that, or specific things that help move on medical educate, medical research. But there may be things then you may offer added value, which reward you, but also allow you to build your own utilities, for example. Maybe you can build your own health app using your data, maybe personal data, which could be your DNA, which then would give you a personalized view on your health. But going back to the regulator, like I think this is one step at a time. And I think that the first leap is if those two things are made true by the regulator, then it's between all parties then to have a phased approach to do this because it's not something you do overnight. I think once, once the regulator decides, look, if we look back at open banking, which is very scarily many years ago, I can't remember how long it is now, but that was a shock to the system because suddenly now banks had absolutely no choice to give up their data to any third party that was regulated. It was a shock to their system. It wasn't a shock to our system per se because we'd always think it was our information anyways, right? It was and it wasn't. So we may not have thought that data was ours, but what was interesting is then we didn't really have a meaningful value exchange for us to want to share our data. That was part of the problem. We never really saw the really amazing use cases that, because realistically what open banking was and is, is an enabler. So it's a means to create more compelling use cases and propositions done in the right way. Now, what will have to happen as we transition is that not only will regulators have to work with industry to make sure this is done in a controlled way, and like open banking, they're not going to like it, <laughs> but there's have to be a staged approach. So it's done in a very meaningful way. People have the choice and they're aware. Look, they may decide, who's to say, one of the concepts from the book is a data trust where a company actually looks after that data for me, no different to a bank. So who's to say that the company who has my data today couldn't become a data trust by default? Let me stop you there, because that was leading to another question I had. You said that going back to open banking and the information the bank has about me is not necessarily mine, but why is that? If I have $1,000 in my bank account, why isn't the fact I have $1,000 in the bank account my, my data? my information. And you're talking about these data trusts where it's a similar situation where they're banking and we're holding it, but that there's value there and that is mine. What's the distinction there? Why isn't the fact that $1,000 is my bank, my information I, that I own? So I think it comes down to the different rules of, so you have in the regulation a data processor and a controller. It comes down to what you've given the rights to your bank to do with your data. Um, GDPR changed a lot of things in terms of what people do with their data. In the model that I'm describing, the difference is the data trust is holding my data on my behalf. So I'm actually still recorded as the owner. Isn't the bank holding hold my $1,000 in trust for me? It technically is, but then it loans it out 10 times legally. So, you know, you can, you can take that as you will. The reality is in a data trust model, I'm actually delegating my data to somebody of my choosing under the terms that I've defined. The difference is now I have, I won't, into the technology, but I have intelligent contracts, which are programmable, which control the relationship that I have with that data trust. And also then how that data is then provisioned and used is again governed by these technologies. So the real big difference here is I give my money to my bank today, but I'm not in control how the vault is managed. I'm not in control of how that bank chooses to operate. All I get in return is a bank account and a list of transactions, which is fine. That's how the world works. Now, if we apply that lens to data, that model doesn't work necessarily because data now is much more fluid, more dynamic, but I'm also going to be acquiring even more, more data and more assets and more value. So it requires much more automation, but more importantly, I, I need to be in control of this because some of this data will be valuable and some of it will never go in a data trust. 
some of it will be held in wallets that I own that I own and use to access my data and also my identity. You just mentioned GDPR, which portends to a bigger issue that there's a lot of different countries in the world. So let's say we do start to view data this way that I own it. We already see it already. The rights I have to my data in America is wildly different, or not wildly, but significantly in some aspects different than it is in the EU. How do we handle that if we truly become owners of this information? I think you still have the same problem if you talk about interoperability in in the world we're moving to with virtual reality, right? How do I, given the fractured nature of the world today, how am I going to move my data even if I didn't own it, right? I think what's going to have to happen, we were actually talking about this today in an event, is that I think it's an 80-20 rule of things. So there'll have to be a basic set of standards that all parties agree. And then anything that falls between the cracks, your wallet probably or some form of technology will obfuscate that data so it doesn't move into that jurisdiction. So it's going to take a collaborative effort. Again, we go back to the regulators, we go back to government to come up with easier said than done, but a, at least almost like an 80-20 rule where everybody's happy with these data sets and their meanings and definitions. And then there's an acceptance then that some data just cannot pass. But that's fine because then you will have the tools then to remove that as you enter that country or as you leave. Let's talk about those tools. What does that look like? You just mentioned that maybe some data you're going to have in a wallet. We will say wallet here. It's similar to a, a blockchain or crypto wallet where it's it's your data and you own it and only you can release or or move this data around. But what's the tech look like? Like you say we leave a country, we can change it. Like what does that look like? It's ironic, right? So the book lays the table at the very beginning and says, look, the real the villain on the horizon is AI, but it's also a possibility to become one of the key enablers of the data revolution. So it won't surprise you that your wallet isn't controlled by you. You have your own AI that runs that. And now we're talking in the world of you know next generation wallets that will manage all of this for you. Um, it's getting there already. Right? I, I, we use Siri to ask questions and do things for us. The wallet will be running on basic terms and definitions defined by you. And then it will automatically know what those standards are and what can be ported in what market and what country. Imagine going on a plane and as you get on the plane, your wallet notifies you that, hey, do you know, where you, I'm going to remove XYZ data. Don't worry about it because it's not allowed in the destination because it knows where you're going. So then as you get on the plane, you get notifications that says, right, I've removed the data. Uh, you enjoy your holiday. All of that is possible. Why? Because we're linking profiles and data. So we're connecting our identities with our data to give it a context. And then it actually knows then based on your profile, and it may have, you may have a holiday, maybe have a, a holiday app on your phone or an LLM, like a large language model or an AI model that manages your travel. And it knows based on various profiles of the things you carry, maybe your watch, maybe other things to combine those things to say, well, actually in the program that I've got my wallet, I know you're traveling and I know you're going here and I know where you are and I'm going to remove the data. So, you know, a lot of the technologies today are heading in that direction. And this is why for me, this is so exciting because Ownership has always been a stumbling block because we've never had the tools to do it. The irony is the tools that we're creating is also forcing us to rethink data. So the AI that's going to actually fuel data is the same tool that's going to question, should we actually own our data as we start to use these tools? Because if we give our data to an AI model, who's to say we know what it becomes and where it's used if we don't own it? So you, you keep mentioning tools there, which I, which I agree, that... that we need them and that's how it's going to work. But I've also heard you say in the past that part of the problem with how we view data and how we kind of lost control of it is us as individuals, is that we as a society have focused too much on the tools and not the fuel underneath these tools, i.e. the data. So what's the distinction there and how are we going to change that? Because you're saying tools are important, but you're saying maybe it's a different focus. It is a focus because now the driver's in the passenger seat. And now the tool is your co-pilot. That's the big shift. So if you, if you go back through history, which I did through a book, <laughs> is that you start to realize that from the very beginning, the focus was on the power of the machine. And then as a consequence of what was being created out of those algorithms, the world suddenly became obsessed with storage. And we've been on that journey ever since. We focused on the machine itself, 
not what was feeding it. So for instance, if I'm an Instagram user, we focus on the fact, oh, I can share my pictures of my good meal on Instagram. But what we were not focused on was the fact that, hey, Instagram's making all this money and it's popular because it's using my my data, the picture of my meal, right? Is that the focus that needs to change? Yeah, so sort of, imagine this, right? So in the in the forties or fifties, I forget the date. A reporter wrote an article in the New Statesman, asking the question, "What are we going to do with all the data we're creating?" Right? Which was kind of the right question, but not quite. The right question would be, "What's the value in all the things that we're creating?" So the reason we have so much storage, quite frankly, is because we're keeping stuff like it's the old T-shirt in the wardrobe. We are spending billions of dollars on storage, but no one's asking the question, where's the liquidity and value in all the data that we have? How much of it is actually useful? What is the value of that? And I bet you the storage numbers wouldn't need to be as high as they are. So it's almost like from the very outset, we focused on data as a byproduct of a transaction. It was a byproduct of an action that we did in a computer that we are striving to make faster and more powerful. And the reality is the real star of the show has always been there, but is behind the curtains that no one can see because it's been hidden behind an experience. And if you go into the 90s then where the internet boomed, that's when the tech giants came in because then they, they actually knew the value of this asset. Because actually using this asset, I can fuel billion dollar industries where the rest of the organizations were still scrambling to try and understand how to compete against a digital giant when they were still in the bricks and mortar world. And they lost sight of the data at that point, and it was never coming back. And then the regulator was caught in the crossfire in all of this. If you remember, how long did it take us to figure out what a cookie was? It was too late at that point. So I think the point here is that we've become so obsessed with experiences, and we've lost sight of the thing that the person who's giving you experience what they really want. They don't want to give you an experience. They want to take the data, and data by itself is useless. They want the value derived from the data because actually that's what feeds the algorithm. So that's the big shift, is that once we take the focus away from the tool and we look at the data we have, and then we apply a tool on top of that as something that we own and we enrich and we build, Suddenly, the tools we use today go next level. All of a sudden, now I go exponential in terms of the possibilities because of all this data that I can consume and enrich in my own environment or in my own means or even partnering with businesses to help me. The point there is, and I've heard you say before, is if you want to make some money in this new paradigm, it's that layer. These tools that are going to facilitate the transfer of the data ownership back to us, that's where to look. Yeah, so it's kind of the thing I, I kind of tease throughout the year and bits and conversations I have. Where the magic really is, is when data is transformed into value. And I always make the case, look, if you were going to invest in this world, it would be the middle layer, that actually where these things will live and operate, that will translate data from intrinsic value into extrinsic value. But more importantly, provide the services then that run the market. Because don't forget, this is a data market now, which requires services to actually work and operate that, but also protect it, as well as oversight wrapping around the whole thing. So you said earlier that regulators hold the key to unlock a whole new economy. That, as we've talked about ad nauseum here today, is it's going to require a shift in all of us, and especially regulators. So how, if you had a regulator on the other side of the table from you and trying to get them to start thinking this way, that, hey, you hold the keys. You, you don't have to wait for business. In fact, you can push the business away. You can push our thinking this way. How do you convince them to do it? Because they're not even thinking this way. Because as you've mentioned, they've mostly generally been reactive. Yeah, it's a great question. And I've been really privileged to speak to regulators around the world, but also participate in forums and events, which are solely, you know, there's me in the room with a load of lawyers, um, you know, <laughs> talking this way. And I think eventually, quite quickly, actually, they think, actually, this is really interesting. This is a different paradigm. And... Maybe five, 10 years ago, it would have been a dead conversation because I think partly because one, there was never really the need. It was almost like this quiet whisper of ownership. It was talked about, you saw articles written, you know, periodically they would appear like blips in the ocean, like dropping a pebble. You'd see an article in Forbes or you'd see something that someone had written, but it never went anywhere. Primarily, that was a few factors, I think, partly because we didn't really have the exponential growth of technology at that time. 
So it, it was felt that it was still under human control and we could put those guidelines in. Some countries, it felt like a straitjacket. Uh, you say the US is an example with HIPAA and other regulations, it becomes really hard to get good healthcare sometimes because of the lack of data access or the fear to innovate with data. So that's the first thing. I think that the second thing then, there wasn't a technology on the horizon which was so disruptive that would disrupt every industry that we know possible. And data was the fuel for that. The third piece is we've never really had the technology to enable it. I always talk about this convergence where technologies are naturally converging, not just for the benefit of us to have great tools and experiences, but because of it to rethink the way that we also operate. I think Cambridge Analytica and various other breaches have made people start being nervous and questioning what companies are doing with their data. And if you throw all that into the melting pot, all of a sudden you come out with new possibilities. And what's exciting is the regulators that I've met are actually open to innovation and want, and want to use this period in our life as an opportunity to maybe go back to first principles and start rethinking the way we we evaluate data and what we think about it. But more importantly, they're now looking at it as an opportunity to be trailblazers and actually be at the forefront, which is which is amazing to hear. And I think, you know, that mindset is being adopted in so many countries now. And I think the signals are there. It's just I think for the first time ever we now have the capability to do this. Heady times, heady times. It'll be interesting to see what everything looks like five years from now, definitely 10 years from now. So, Michael, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. People want to keep tabs on you and find out when your book comes out, keep track of progress. Where do you want to send them? I think, you know, in a data world, it's probably LinkedIn for now. That's the best place to be causing problems and trouble. And obviously events and things like that that are, that are coming up over the next 12 months. You know, being on this podcast is, as, as we said in the sort of pre-conversation is, you know, for me, in writing the book, I, I was writing it for two audiences, really. One was for businesses and leaders, and every chapter tells a business and a leader what to do. But on the flip side, I also have the same conversation with the government and the regulator in every chapter to say to them, okay, if data does become an asset, if data does become a financial instrument, if it becomes a utility, if it becomes a means of generating knowledge, this is what you need to do. So for me, speaking to regulators is actually part of the puzzle. They now have the opportunity for the first time in technology history to be right at the forefront and change a dynamic. And that was the reason for coming on the podcast was, can we now, you know, as regulators and, and legal professionals, start something which could lead to something truly, you know, mind-blowing in terms of the possibilities, but also leverage the real power of these technologies, knowing that we've done the right things so we can actually get the best of them. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.